John chapter 2, we continue. We continue in the journey of the gospel of John. And we're going to go right into it, and I'm actually going to read these verses to you. John chapter 2, verse 13. If you're with me here, church, and you brought your Bibles or your phone or your iPad or whatever it is that you want to look it on, that's fine with me. As long as you brought something, if not, share it with something, because I want you to read with me. I hope you brought your Bibles. And, that, and again, I stress that if you, this day and age, if you brought your phone and you have one of them smartphones, I'll say it that way, right? That's okay. You there, say Amen. Now the Passover, I read from the New King James Version. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. Verse 16, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, when they saw the signs which he, had, which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. If I were to ask most of you here as I look out into the congregation, I would venture to say that most of you, if not all of you, have heard of the story in which Jesus comes into the temple, as in some places we say he cleanses the temple, he overturns the tables in the temple, he brings out that cord as, right, makes a whip of this, and makes a cord and starts to, to whip these animals out of his place, out of this place. It's interesting to note though that this aspect of Jesus cleansing the temple, if we can say it that way, is taking place in the Gospel of John in the beginning. In the other Gospels, where does this take place? If you were in the first service, be silent. Well, if you look in the Gospels, it takes place towards the beginning or the end. That wasn't a rhetorical question. That's okay, you could answer. Beginning or end, church? Beginning. Well, no, it takes place at the end. And so some scholars have wondered in the course of history, was there two cleansings or one? I'm with the affirmation that there was two cleansings, one at the beginning and one at the end for many reasons. And so these encounters are extremely important. It's a, it's a, it's a side of Jesus that for the most part, you, you don't really see in other encounters, certainly directly with the Pharisees and Sadducees in one other section in the Gospels overall. But you really have to, we really have to put ourselves in this story. You see, because here Jesus is going into this, this beautiful temple. It wasn't as beautiful as the first temple. It was Herod's temple, the second temple. With these beautiful pillars, right? This beautiful place. And where this took place, if you Google it or if you go online, right? Where this took place was in the court of the Gentiles. It was the only place where Gentiles, you and I, could go to. That's interesting to note. A whole, really, there's a whole sermon in that too. But there Jesus goes, and the one place where the Gentiles could really see what this temple was about, all this was taking place that really shouldn't be taking place in the way and in the manner in which it was taking place. So Jesus comes to this, he looks, and sure he brings out the whip and the cord and starts pulling everybody out, lifting up tables. And I could only envision 
the stair. My sanctified imagination here. It's not in, in the narrative, but the stare that Jesus had as he was looking to all of these people, leaders, poor, young, rich, old. It was the time of the what? Church, we just read it. What was the time of? The time of the Passover. Now look, you don't have to have gone to seminary, spent years in school and all this to understand what the Passover. Church, what was the Passover about? The children of Israel, right? Freedom from slavery, right? Doorpost, blood, you're good. Doorpost, no blood, you're in bad shape. That's, that's right? i say that again. Doorpost, blood, victory. Doorpost, no blood, deadly. And so this Passover, this freedom clearly indicated and focused and it was all about Who? Jesus. Everything that took place in that temple was about Jesus. I've, as I've said here before many times, what my professor once told me, in, you know, before taking an exam about the temple and all of the stuff that took place in there, you know, he would say, if you forget anything of what the stuff in the temple symbolizes, just say this word. You ready? Jesus. You probably can't go wrong there. And so now Jesus, who previously in the book of John says that he came to his own and his own knew him not, well, he came to his own. And none of them realized not only that Jesus was there per se, the one in that, in that way, but they had, in essence, we can say a lot of things of why Jesus was upset. But I would venture to say in 21st century terminology that Jesus was not upset because the pastor didn't wear a tie. Jesus was not upset because people came into the church in jeans or in a shirt. Jesus was not upset because the church had pews instead of chairs or chairs instead of pews. Jesus was not upset because the color of the rug was pink, yellow, blue, yellow, whatever it may be. Jesus was upset because they had missed the big picture. They had not made the main thing the main thing. They had majored in the minors and forgot the major aspect of everything that the temple was about was about Jesus. It was Passover for goodness sakes and they were just going about their business trying to make money. Now granted there was I'm sure folks in there that were sincere. Jesus was just a little upset. Just think how Jesus would feel if we come into this place. If we come into this place and our minds and our hearts are not here. That we don't make things about Jesus. It is interesting to me. It is interesting that nowhere in the New Testament that I can recall specifically does the New Testament ever associate the temple of God with a building. Like a building. Like this one. It's interesting that we spend, and there's room for it, I'm not saying there isn't, but it's interesting that sometimes we spend more time discussing what happens in approximately an hour, and if the preacher goes too long, two hours, in a building for worship than we do in focusing what happens in the real building that God wants to dwell in the rest six plus days of the week. Good or bad in the discussion. You see, because I would venture to say that when Jesus was in there, he was not worried in essence of that temple. He knew that that temple was going to be what? destroyed, not too far, technically not too far. But he also knew what was to come and the purpose of why he was there. Follow me with these texts, and I hope that you write them down, you look them up, but look at what the Bible says about a temple. And, and, and many of us have read it before. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go with me if you have your Bibles. Please go with me to 1 Corinthians. Leave a marker in John chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to fly by these texts pretty quickly. But nonetheless, I want to mention them. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. The focus there is that the Christian community is the temple. 
You with me? Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells what? In you. Now, not just there in 1 Corinthians, but as you see now, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Paul is making, seems to be making a pretty big issue at this to the Corinthians. For a whole big sermon on that, that's for another day. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now here the focus is more on the individual being the temple. A corporate aspect and an individual aspect. God, so far, the Bible overall is not saying, be ye careful what kind of steeple you put, or if you put a steeple on that church. Be ye careful the size uh, and, and scope of the pulpit or anything else. <laughs> Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Now here the context is to not be unequally yoked, you know, a Christian with a non-Christian. But in that context, listen to what the Apostle Paul once again says to the same church. In what agreement has the temple of God, who's the temple of God here? We are, with idols. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, now he quotes the Old Testament here. I will dwell, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And I believe the, 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 the one that really has and is and does cause me to ponder this text powerfully. Ephesians. Go with me. This is the last one here. I'm doing a little proof texting if you allow me. I don't do it often, but Ephesians 2, 19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built or having built a church and a building that is really good, now you, well, that's not in there, right? Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, in other words, the word of God, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, now when it says building here, church, is it referring to an actual location? An actual brick and mortar type building? Or any kind of building? No. Being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a what? A dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In the book of Revelation, when there's a letter sent out to the seven churches, that first church where it says that Jesus is walking among them, right? When Jesus is walking among the church, it's not that he's walking around a building. He's walking around the people and he's saying, you have lost your what? Your first love. So today, I have to ask, we have to ask. We have to ask a very specific question, especially feeding off this quote. And obviously with what we have just heard from the, from the Bible. A man by the name of Bob Snyder said this. What is the church? The best way to kill the church is to squeeze it into a building. For without contact with people in need and publicly witnessing faith and trust in Jesus, a church will quietly die. When we continually think that church is simply what takes place on a Saturday morning or afternoon, when we continually do church as we've always done it, and perhaps you haven't even realized how you've done church, where you come you fall asleep or you wake up or you half listen or you half don't listen, you half worship, you half don't worship, however it is. More and more when I read who and what God really intends as the temple of his dwelling, can we go as far as to say that we're sinning against God when we come together as the temple of God and not truly worshiping? So today, I got to ask, what is it that Jesus needs to drive away from your life, my life, in order to purify the temple? Now, not this temple, 
not what happens here at first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or eighth service. We don't have eight services, but. There's room and a time and a place for those discussions, but that's not what we're going to discuss today. It's what does Jesus need to cleanse from our hearts that he may dwell in our temple? Because according to scripture, Jesus is concerned. God is heavily concerned and wants to dwell in your heart, not in a building. The Bible says that God cannot be contained in a building. And you know, I'm not even going to go with specifics about, well, maybe God wants to uproot the anger in your life, or God wants to uproot the, that you're very cheap, or that God wants to uproot that you say you love Jesus, but you never even say hello Jesus throughout the week, and then you come on Saturday and you expect entertainment or whatever it is that you expect or don't expect, or don't, you don't expect anything, so you don't get anything. I'm not even going to go into all that, though I just did. But what I'm actually going to go into, what I felt led to, is to go back to John chapter 2, where we're getting our text from. And I want to detail three specific aspects from this narrative that I hope challenge us to evaluate our hearts, our lives, our temple. And where Jesus needs to uproot and what he may need to uproot that you may decide. For who am I to say this or that or that or this? Certainly as a preacher, a person who stands up here, steps on people's toes and all that stuff. It's part of my job. But today we're going to do a little twist. You see, I believe one of the first aspects is jealousy. Excitement. Fervor of spirit. Go to verse 17. Of John chapter 2, verse 17, right? Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Essentially, we need to ask ourselves as we evaluate what Jesus needs to uproot in our lives, what he needs to overturn in our hearts, so his dwelling can really have power in our lives. Do you really have zeal for God as much as you may say that you have zeal for God? I just read this week, and I should have had that statistic up there, but I just read this week that the amount of time that people spend on Facebook in one year jumped a month from, I think it was a little over five hours, to eight hours a month. (laughs) Eight hours a month. That's taken professionally. And you can go on Mashable.com and read this. There you go. You could find that. I don't have the statistic up, but you could go to Mashable.com. They are a tech internet place that has all kinds of information. Keep you up. You know, people know I like tech and all that good stuff. Eight hours a month. It's gone up. And Facebook even isn't the most visited site in the internet. The most visited site in the internet is Google, and then Facebook, and then who's third? Just out of your curiosity if you want to know. No, actually it's Yahoo. I think and YouTube is in there too. Eight hours, so I wonder if we were to take, if we were to take a little bit of a, of a survey, we're not going to, but we were to take a survey, knowing that God reads our hearts, knowing that God knows everything about us, and we were to compare the time that we spend in zeal for God, and doing the things of God, right? And then the time that we spend, not just on Facebook, but on anything else. I wonder how those scales would weigh. But then we tell God, God, you're everything to me. You know, I, I used to, uh, many, many years ago, many of you know that I used to work for a chiropractor, many chiropractors. That was my major back four score seven years ago. And I met many different doctors of chiropractic. And these men and women have to go to chiropractic school, spend eight years in total, you know, undergrad, graduate school. And I met some that had wonderful passion for what they did. Whether you like them or not, I'm not asking you if you like them or not. I'm just telling you. They had passion for people. They had passion for what they did. 
But I met one, and actually became really good friends with this one. And, and, and I met many. And this one clearly told me this. Clearly. I got into chiropractic because of this. He didn't, he didn't give me offering plates. He just told me, you know. Because of money. Now, I worked for this guy, you know. And he said, the only reason that I became a chiropractor was because, well, you know, it was a good profession and it made money. Now, obviously, if you were to ask me the zeal, now he may come out and you could see him with patience and you would never know that he really didn't have zeal for what he did. Praise the Lord, he is no longer a, chiro a practicing chiropractor at this time for you to know. But at that time, he had no zeal for what he did. No passion. And I think many of us live that kind of life. Surely, we, some of us have more passion over information about God than we have passion for God who gives the information. So as you evaluate what it is that Jesus needs to uproot in your life, what kind of passion, what kind of zeal, what kind of fervor of spirit do you have for the things of God? When you hear we're having a public evangelistic meeting, is it, wow, God, God is going to do something? Or is it, oh God, am I going to have to go every day? I don't know. I've heard those things before. Well, maybe it's not for you. It's for you to invite somebody if, you, if, if able. Zeal for God. Secondly, after zeal for God, this one's powerful. The power of the resurrection. Listen to what Jesus says, verse 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Now, interestingly enough, scholars have said that actually, to some degree, the temple wasn't even finished, fully finished, until seven years before the temple actually was destroyed in 70 AD. Interesting tidbit there, as, as I was studying this week. Some may disagree with that, scholarly-wise. 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his what, church? Therefore, now this is amazing. When he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So at that time, when Jesus spoke to them, even the disciples had a big question mark over their heads. Kind of like some of y'all's faces right now. But it, I won't, that's just, you know, I don't know if you're just hungry or. But the big question mark over their heads. They didn't get what Jesus said until two years or so down the road when Jesus resurrected. Then they captured and they went back to what he said. Now in all seriousness, that has happened to me to some extent, not in that way as Jesus, but when one is speaking, preaching, trying to make a point. Sometimes people don't get it. Either I didn't say it properly, I didn't, or they interpreted wrong, or both, or whatever it is. But sometime later, somebody will bring something up. It will be explained, further opened up in different aspects. And then they go, oh, now I get it. Or if you were in school or something, right? You kind of move along in your education. And at some point, you think back and I go, oh. And it had to do with the resurrection, the Apostle Paul says, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Listen, folks, we wait until Easter to really talk about resurrection sometimes as Christians. And we make a big deal about it, you know. And, and that's fine, and there's, a, and there's room for that, and that's what we do because it's, you know, the, the Holy Week and the whole nine yards. But the reality is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is where we need to live. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity, there is no church, there is no temple, there is nothing. Salvation would have failed. 
The cross is the epitome of where everything changes. And the resurrection is the power that we can now receive because Jesus has resurrected. There is power in the resurrection of Jesus. No longer do I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I used to live, I now live by faith. In who? In the resurrected King of Jesus. There is power to overcome all of our sins. There is power to overcome some of our lazy, fair lives in Christian aspects. If we allow God to convict, convey our hearts and say, you know what, we need to live with this resurrection power. We need to not just focus on two hours of worship on a Saturday, but focus on the six plus days in which the temple of God is continuing out there in the world. And are we like those leaders and and, and followers or supposed followers that were in the temple that went along with their daily business in the, in the place where the Gentiles should have seen the foundation, the cornerstone Jesus, but instead they just saw traffic and people. The power of the resurrection. Several years ago, in a district here in this conference, Our treasurer in that church was dying. She had suffered long with an illness and she was literally down to her last breaths. It was December and my wife and I, as we normally do, we were going off to see our family in Miami. But we were kind of waiting and, 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 and seeing what would happen with this wonderful lady. I lived about an hour away from the city it was a multi-church district and I lived about an hour away. And so they called me and they said, Pastor, she is, as I mentioned, in her last breaths. And I drove up there, came into the ICU room. There were several people there, her family, of course, some of her children, health professionals that worked at the hospital that were from our church. And we gathered together. And, and I've... For as long as I've been doing this, I've been in this situation before. But this one always kind of stuck in my head. Because as they were gathered here with this lady, I remember that her daughter kind of picked her up and, and literally she just was just lying there basically dead. And we all started singing. When we all get together, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout for victory. And tears were streaming down our eyes. You know, even the nurses were, were there. And, and obviously in an ICU, there were other people there. And they allowed us to sing. And, and, and it was just such a moment where you felt the Spirit of God. Yet the only way that we can sing and rejoice in the midst of such a sadness of a person dying and let me tell you, if Jesus doesn't come, we're all going to die sooner or later. The only reason was that we had hope in the resurrection of Jesus. Because he lives. I live. Because he lives, we have that hope. And sometimes we live without that hope. We say we have it, but we surely don't show it. And so as Jesus is cleansing out the inner aspect of our temples... Are we living that resurrection power? Do others see Jesus in that power that lies within us of a living Christ? Not a complaining Christ. Of a living Christ. Thirdly, and this one baffles my mind. And lastly, one's evaluation and true essence of faith in Jesus. Read with me again verses 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit and trust, depending on your version, himself to them, because he knew all men. And had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in what? These texts, at least me personally, have often baffled me, as I said. But these texts not only give me hope, 
assurance, but also kind of challenged me. You see, because here Jesus, the Word of God, says when Jesus didn't commit or entrust himself, that same word in the Greek is where we get the word belief, to believe. And Jesus, the Bible says, knew all men. Ah, that's wonderful. Now, that's something we all know. But you see, right now, and during the week, Jesus know, knows every aspect of your life. That's why, you know, when I, many, many years ago, when I first started speaking, and you look out into the congregation after the course of time, even the best of preachers wonder and ponder. I'll just say it that way. They wonder and ponder. And we're, we're young, and then we, we move on and we say, oh, wait a minute. It's not about me. Forgive me, God. It's about you. And you know each one is individual's heart and you know them so well as he was there as he committed these miracles people began to believe in him but Jesus knew that the people that said they believed in him and came to believe in him their faith wasn't really faith because later on some of those people perhaps were the ones that said what Crucify him. When it comes to your faith in Jesus, how has your faith increased? What can Jesus really entrust you with? What have you committed in trusting in Jesus in your life? How have you shown that faith that can move mountains as we sang. How have you shown that faith? We are in the first day of October. Happy October. We are almost nearing the end of the year. Right? Two months. Well, a month and we're going to start hearing jingle bells. And if you and I were to sit down and evaluate our lives from January has your faith increased? Has your faith been challenged? Have you spent more time with God and zeal for Him and living resurrection power? Is your faith the same? Are you more interested in just simple words of the Bible and not living out the Bible in your life? This aspect of faith, the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. Many people, and I believe in public evangelistic meetings, but within sometimes our faith, Seventh-day Adventist faith, many people sometimes stay stuck on 28, now 28 fundamental beliefs. Now, I believe in those 28 fundamental beliefs. But we stay stuck like if that information is all we need. And our faith stumbles. As we close this morning, this afternoon. I finish by saying that the temple in which God wants to dwell is in you. Acknowledge and allow him to cleanse it. But let me tell you, that could be painful. Now, when I'm about to say, I say it to myself, but the older I get, sometimes the harder that gets. Sometimes we think that just the young people, right? Young adults, those 17, 18, 19, 20, well, they think they know it all, you know? Give them a car and now they own the world. You know, give them a driver's license and now they own the world. And, and, and there's, there's that aspect true. You know, we know everything because we just, we're 19. Or whatever age. But hey, not simply in their defense, but that happens with me. And I'm 37. Admitted right here, publicly, online. So it can be painful. 
And sometimes the older we get, the more we get into our ways of religion instead of relationship. We get more structured. And we can't see this fervent aspect in people. We can't see this resurrection power and our faith begins to be chopped down to simple rules and regulations instead of a relationship that which therefore comes out a life excited about God because he's alive in a faith that is seen by everyone. Not that we want to see it, but people see Jesus in us. So it may not be easy, but as, as we close the service with this song and I ask Sonia to come forward, listen to the words. The temple in which God wants to dwell is in you. Acknowledge and allow him to cleanse it. At the cross, everything changed. At the cross, as the song said, the veil was torn. No longer was there a temple needed. No longer was there any other sacrifice needed except for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, in Revelation, the Bible says that in the New Jerusalem, there is no temple. For God himself is the temple. And I just want to perhaps just even state that that temple that, 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 that God is in, that God is the temple, is in our hearts. Along with God himself being the temple. Because God has dwelt in our hearts and we have that zeal for him. And we have that power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he's alive. And we have a faith that can move mountains. That no matter what happens, our faith is in Jesus. So what is it? What is it that Jesus needs to uproot, tear down, allow him to do so? Pray with me. Gracious God. You know each person's heart. You know where each person is here. And Lord, I pray that as you stepped into that temple and you uprooted, challenged the status quo because, Lord, they were not making you the main thing. They had missed the bigger point. I pray, Lord, that in our hearts, in our lives, that you, Lord, through your grace, your mercy, that our hearts will be open to allow you to change what needs to be changed in our hearts, what we need to do away with. And may these, these three aspects that we spoke about, may we gauge it, judge it by them and to, to some degree. Where is our zeal? What kind of life, empowered life are we living? Are we living that resurrected life? And is our faith a faith that is invigorating, empowering, and growing every day by faith in you, Jesus? Lord, it's time. Uproot my heart, Lord. Here I am. Here are your people. For I pray this in Jesus. Jesus Jesus, in your name, amen.